OK, so let's have a look at an audit report question. This one comes from December 2006, and it's a three-part question, which, as well as looking at audit reports, is also going to act as a useful introduction to the world of group audits. Let's start off by having a look at part A. Five marks, which normally indicates we're looking to say five things. Let's see what it says. Explain the auditor's responsibilities for reporting non-compliance that comes to the auditor's attention during the conduct of an audit. If you read the introduction just above that, it starts talking about laws and regulations. So what this question is asking is, if when doing an audit, you discover that your client is breaking some law or regulation, what are your reporting responsibilities? What do you need to do as auditor? Well, let's have a think. If you're doing an audit and you discover that your client, your client's staff, or there's something in the processes which is illegal, who do you think you should tell first? Surely the starting point is to tell the client. And by client, we typically mean the audit committee, or if there is no audit committee, the board of directors. Of course, if it's something fairly minor, which is unlikely to be repeated, you might leave it until the end of the audit. But if they've broken the rules once and they don't get told, they might break them again. So the sooner you tell the client, the better. Well, this is worth five marks, not one, so what else do we say? Is there anybody else we might need to report this to? Well, of course, if the laws and regulations being broken are fairly serious, there might need to be some external reporting. You may have to report this to some outside body. And in some cases, of course, you may need to report to some outside body without telling the client. Who else might you need to report this to? Well, potentially, you might need to tell the shareholders. The breaking of the law might well mean that the financial statements are wrong. If, for example, they haven't provided for the fines and penalties that are surely coming their way once someone finds out they've broken the law.
So that would seem to be the main part of the answer for part A. Other people you might consider telling, the internal auditors of your client, possibly. You might even want to say something at the company's AGM, maybe for ethical reasons, or you are concerned about the integrity of the company's directors. So those are your reporting responsibilities. That didn't seem too bad. And that is a very typical question in that it picks a fairly small audit standard and asks you about it for about five or six marks. There are a few other audit standards we'll need to look at a bit later on, which could also come up in this respect. Let's move on to part B, which is the main reason for doing the question, the audit report that we've been given. We've been assigned to the audit of Cleves for the year ended 30th September 2006. During the year, Cleves acquired a 100% interest in another company. A subsidiary, in other words. Howard is material to Cleves. So this subsidiary is material enough that it would be consolidated. And it's audited by another firm, Par & Co. So, our client has a subsidiary, but the subsidiary is audited by someone else. As such, we would want to review their work and also understand their audit opinion to see if it would impact on ours at the group level. You have just received Par's draft auditor's report for the year. The wording is that of an unmodified report except for the opinion paragraph. Right. If the only thing that PAR are changing is the opinion paragraph, what do we think they're doing? Well, it shouldn't be a limitation on scope because that would change the audit responsibilities or basis of opinion section. It shouldn't be an emphasis of matter because that would add another paragraph underneath. If they're only changing the opinion section, what they must be trying to do is issue a disagreement. And now we've been given the opinion section. The question says, critically appraise the appropriateness of the audit opinion given by Par & Co. For the years ended, and notice it's both this year's and last year's. Well, if a disagreement is the right thing to do, what would we expect to be in the opinion section? So, firstly, the heading of the section should make it clear that it's a qualified opinion, and why. Secondly, Secondly, the auditors should make clear what the mistake is, and that would normally involve mentioning an accounting standard or standards that have been breached. Next, the auditors need to quantify the effect of putting the mistake right. Finally, we should have either an accept for or 
an adverse opinion. So if this is a disagreement, that's what we'd be expecting to see. Let's now go and have a look and see what we see. Well, the first thing I notice is that the heading just says audit opinion. It doesn't make it clear that there's a qualification. So that's the first thing I'll need to comment on. It then says, as more fully explained in notes 11 and 15, impairment losses on non-current assets have not been recognised in profit or loss as the directors are unable to quantify the amounts. Well, if there's been an impairment, the directors should have quantified the amounts. In our provi uh, opinion, provision should be made for these as required by IAS 36. Well, you can't really argue with this. An impairment should have been put through the accounts. It hasn't been. And so, on that basis, we'd have to agree that the auditors have got that bit right. So, informing our answer, the first point is that the heading has not been changed. But, on the second point... I agree that the auditors have properly explained the mistake. The next stage should be to quantify the effects of putting the mistake right. Let's go and see. If the provision had been so recognised, the effect would have been to increase the loss before and after tax for the year, and reduce the value of tangible and intangible non-current assets. Well, that's correct. However, as the directors are unable to quantify the amounts, we are unable to indicate the financial effect of such omissions. So, the auditors have correctly said what would change, and in what direction, but there are no numbers there. So that is inappropriate. There should be numbers there. But hang on, is it the auditor's fault that they are unable to quantify the figures? It isn't, is it? They can't do it because the directors have failed to carry out a detailed impairment review. So it's not the auditor's fault, they've not been given the evidence. This isn't a disagreement at all, is it? If the auditors have not been provided with the evidence to allow them to give their opinion properly, that's missing evidence... And that's a limitation on scope. Here we are analysing this disagreement, what we like about it and don't like about it, and the fact is, this is surely a limitation on scope. Auditors have not been given the, the appropriate evidence, and as such, we don't know how much of an impairment there's been. In fact, when we get to the next bit, should this be except for or adverse, the answer is, I don't know because I don't know how much of an impairment there's been. In fact, without the evidence, do we even know if there has been an impairment? Now, normally with an impairment, I would say except for disagreement would be more likely, because it's fairly easy to explain which numbers are wrong, and there are plenty of other things in the accounts that haven't suffered an impairment. Most numbers would still be correct. In the question... The opinion given says, in view of the failure, in our opinion, the financial statements do not present fairly, do not give a true and fair view. Well, that's an adverse opinion, isn't it?
And as I just explained, I think except four would seem more appropriate, but the reason that the auditors cannot quantify the errors is a lack of evidence from the directors. And that means, surely, this should be a limitation on scope. And if that's the case, the auditor's responsibilities, basis of opinion section, should explain the missing evidence and the opinion should probably say except for any adjustments which might have been necessary the financial statements give a true and fair view. Now, that's one of those questions where if you don't spot it's a limitation on scope, you may struggle to pass it. If you think about how auditors come to their opinion, normally question one is, have we got enough evidence? So you think about limitation on scope first. It's only when you can answer that question, yes, we've had enough evidence, that you then move on to consider disagreements. This is surely a limitation on scope. It is the director's responsibility to carry out full impairment reviews and get proper valuations done. The directors have failed in that responsibility. Let's now move on to part C of the question. Well, part C, or maybe B part 2 is its proper name, says briefly explain the implications of Parr & Co's audit opinion for your audit opinion on the consolidated financial statements of Cleves, in other words, the group accounts, for the year ended 2006. Now, at this point, we notice something which proves the importance of reading the question. Because I've missed something out in B part 1, haven't I? Now, hopefully, you spotted this before I had to remind you about it. But on purpose, I thought I would just leave this point out, knowing that the question had made this point, and just see if you'd realised. It's only when you go back and read the question, which is always a very wise thing to do, that we notice that in B part 1, we're meant to have mentioned 2006 and 2005. And that audit report only talks about 2006, which is another criticism. Because if that was the audit report given in both of those years, surely in this year's report it should be pointing out that the corresponding figures have also got a problem with them. So, that's B part one. Now, let's move on to B part two. How does Parr's audit opinion impact on Cleves? Well, the main issue here is materiality.
So it should be consolidated. As such, if there's a problem with the subsidiaries' accounts, it might be material in the group accounts. The problem in this case is we don't know how material the problem is because the directors haven't presented the evidence. The fact is, we simply don't know. We know there might be a material problem in the subsidiaries' accounts, and if it might be material there, it might be material at group level. The only reason we might not qualify is if we added up all the assets in the subsidiaries' accounts, and if even a full impairment of 100% wasn't material to the group accounts, then the problem could not be material to the group accounts. But if the total assets in Howard's accounts is greater than the group materiality figure, it is possible that an impairment could be material to the group audit opinion as well. Only worth three marks, so there's not a huge amount we need to say, but that is how we deal with B part two. Okay, we've looked at an audit report question. Just before we go a little bit further, we ought to look at one or two smaller issues that can impact on an audit report. We're going to start by looking at something that we had a brief mention of, other information. This, as I previously mentioned, is the stuff which is attached to audited financial statements but which itself is not audited. So, the most likely example of this is the annual report, as most of its content is not subject to an audit. The problem is that because it's attached to the audited accounts, there's a danger that there might be something in the annual report that we don't report on, we don't audit, but which says something that confuses the shareholders. It might be that it says something that's just plain wrong, or it might make reference to something which implies that the financial statements aren't accurate, even if our audit report says they are accurate.
So, auditors need to read the annual report and anything else which is going to be attached to the published accounts. If there's anything in there which appears wrong or confusing or misleading to the shareholders, we would ask the board to change it. But what if they won't change it? Well, if they won't change it, we cannot mention this in the audit opinion because we don't give an opinion on these things. But we have a professional responsibility, surely, to tell the shareholders. But how do we do it if we can't give an audit opinion on it? Well, there are two main ways we can contact the shareholders about this. One possibility is to go to the AGM and actually tell them there and then. In fact, much of the stuff that is attached to the audited accounts might not actually be ready for us to read until after we've finished our audit. So the AGM might be our only answer to this. If, on the other hand, the matter that we have read about is linked somehow to the accounts, the accounts are right, but maybe the chairman's statement or something else seems to imply the accounts are not right, maybe it would be wise for us to use the audit report to mention this. We can't put it in the audit opinion, but what we could do is use an emphasis of matter. So there we go, that is other information. We don't audit it, but we do need to read it to make sure there is nothing misleading, confusing or just wrong in there. Anything that there is, ask the directors to change it. If they won't, and it has a link somehow with the financial statements, maybe an emphasis of matter is the way to tell the shareholders. On the other hand, if it's nothing to do with the accounts, it's just something we know to be wrong or misleading, maybe the AGM is the more appropriate place to tell the shareholders. And that's other information. We're now going to move on and look at a second issue that could affect audit reports. Subsequent events. Let's just assume a little example. Let's imagine we're auditing a client and we finished our audit work and the partner signed the audit report on April the 14th. The AGM, the annual general meeting, is due to be held on May the 30th when the financial statements will be placed in front of the shareholders and probably they'll say yes, accept them and they'll be sent off to company's house or wherever. But what if in that gap an error is discovered in the financial statements. We said that the accounts were true and fair, but it's now become apparent after we finished our audit that in fact there's a mistake. What do we do? The problem is that the accounts have probably been sent for printing, might even have been sent out to the shareholders in advance of the AGM, and our audit report says they're right. We now know they're not right. What do we do about this? Well, the first thing is to try to find out what the company intend to do about it. 
because the board of directors really should reissue the accounts, having corrected the mistake. Well, if that's what the board are going to do, it's a little bit annoying. It's the right thing to do, of course, but the problem now is that we've signed an audit report a couple of weeks ago, and the financial statements have now been reissued. We need a new audit report, dated on or after the date of the new set of accounts. And in order to issue that audit report, the auditors will now have to do extra audit work from the end of the last audit, in other words, the date of the last audit report, up to today. This is because, as well as making sure that the mistake has been properly corrected, we need to make sure that the directors have not put through any other alterations, and also there might be additional adjusting post-balance sheet events in that gap period. So that's what we do if the directors are changing the financial statements. But what if they're not? What if the board say they're not going to change them? They want to leave it until next year. Well, that's wrong. The shareholders are about to be presented with inaccurate financial statements, and worse still, the directors aren't going to tell them, and double worse still, our audit report, which they've already got, says the accounts are fine. We cannot let this situation carry on. If that is the case, we need to make it clear to the shareholders that we are withdrawing our audit opinion and that the directors are lying to them. This is a very difficult legal situation, so legal advice will be essential. And if your client is going to be this naughty and show this lack of integrity, I suspect you'd want to resign. And that is subsequent events and what an auditor does when mistakes are discovered after you've signed your audit report, but before the AGM.